So I have been learning many at night, sitting on top of the bed before I could sleep. I always wanted to guarantee myself that I should learn something new every day. That was the primary goal for me. I have 10 to 20 students for a 10 day intake. So I get to teach them understanding the whole fundamentals of us on its own or also what it can implement in the long run. Coding and electronics, they work hand in hand. We need coding for electronics to work. So it's more like we produce language for them to be able to speak to us. The world is turning into a very different platform. Everything is being automated. So we're shifting in a very cool family. Oh. Electronics was a groundbreaking for me. My feeling is that times have changed. The digital revolution is taking over. So the world needs to start focusing more on the teaching skills. Unemployment is a wrap. We need skills that are relevant and current. Because if you learn one step, you'll be able to take 10 more. I wish the opportunities were more implemented, especially around where I grew up, especially with the people that I... Opportunity that has taken part at the library. She just simply said it deals with computers. I was a bit skeptical about it. Then I started... My hope for the future generation is to start learning today. Start learning the relevant digital world of side of things. We need more people to actually be part of this digital world. Ladies and gentlemen, our applause for the level of Welcome to the Parkways Transparency Commission's launch of the Digital Manifesto. And like I said earlier on, this is a journey that has to continue, and we'll get to chat a lot more about this. My name is Bonnie Tunya. I'm the co-productions editor for the BBC's Africa Service, and I'm very honoured uh, this morning to be joined by Melinda Gates, uh, who's the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Mr. Strive Masiiwa, who's the founder and executive chairman of Econet Group. That would be a good place to clap. Um, so my uh, guest will be engaging me in trying to figure out, we've had a commission that has worked over the past two years to come up with a roadmap that could possibly be used by, by not just the countries, countries that participated in sharing their ideas and experiences in terms, terms of developing the digital strategies. strategies but also can be shared widely by other African and uh, developing countries that wish to be uh, on the driver's seat of this digital onslaught that we now talk about. And so we'll be spending the next 30 minutes just trying to figure out how can developing countries get it right and what are the real opportunities thereof. So I'd like to just, just jump right into it and uh, perhaps just uh, strive. The report is out. There's a lot of work um, that has already been uh, gone into this, but in very few words, how can developing countries get this right? First of all, it's great to be in Nairobi again. We've come full circle in terms of the work on this report. We launched the, the work of the commission here in Nairobi two years ago. It's been an extraordinary journey for all of us, and in particular the, the team that worked on this. You know, in, in answer to your question, uh, there have been there have been many technological revolutions in times before us, but as developing countries, we've never been at a place where we could participate in what was to happen to us in that technological development. This is truly a unique moment and a unique opportunity 
for us as developing countries to be in the conversation and participate in framing the future. From here, we can only blame ourselves mm -hmm. if we do not take up the challenge. Uh, this is going to happen, the, the, this is going to affect everybody. There's no one who's not going to be affected by what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. But there's going to be winners and losers. Mm -hmm. Now is the opportunity to position ourselves to be winners, but most importantly, to ensure that everybody is involved. Everybody is included. It's going to happen. We can't opt out. The question is, who's going to lose? How do we mitigate against it? Right. And I'll stop there. Right. And Melinda, perhaps if you may, how, do, how, how can uh, developing countries take control of the digital future? I think it's first by painting the vision of saying where do where do they where does each country want to go with right. digital inclusion, and then to co-create the future that you want in your African community or or, or in your country. Right. And what we see and part of this report and the toolkit is really trying to help countries. There was a lot of listening done, a lot of going out into communities, going out into cities, <laughs> listening to where people want to go with right. technology in their own countries and then trying to come up with a toolkit. What is the right regulations that you have to get done properly? Mm -hmm. What do you do about financing, both financing for technology in the country, mm -hmm. but opening up financing for entrepreneurs? How do you think about inclusivity? If you want to really create the society that you want in your own country, you've got to think about including everyone. Right, right. And so this was a toolkit to try and help countries say, what's worked in other places, but what might work for us? Right. And we were pretty excited to see that you know South Africa decided to run a diagnostic on where they are with digital inclusion mm -hmm. and digital finance and digital health records in their own country. Same with Ethiopia, same with Mongolia, right. to try and say where do we want to go for our country in the future. Right. And you mentioned inclusivity. Um, how then do we make uh, the digital revolution, if you could call it that, uh, force for inclusion? Well, it gives us an opportunity. It is, I mean, we know digital is a game changer, right? right? I mean, when you walk, we're here in Nairobi, when you drive down the street or walk down the street, you know, the number of people with cell phones in their hands, we all have them, right? right. We, we right. use them. It creates this tip, this turning point that if you get digital, you get that technology in everybody's hands, they start to create the future that they want. What do I mean by that? Okay, today, you have to think about who's not included. Right. Women. About 10% less of women have mobile phones than men do mm -hmm. across the continent in low and middle income countries on the continent. Same thing, when you say who is connected to the internet, a woman is 23% less likely to be included in the internet. So we have to think about how do you include them. Let me give you some examples. If, for instance, we've been out in, in communities where they've decided that they want to put a kiosk in their community so that women, women want to come and right. learn about mobile phone ownership, there's a woman there training them on the phone, training them about digital finance, right. and then the women all of a sudden say, my gosh, I wasn't, I wasn't welcomed in the banking sector, but now I can save in my village a dollar a day, two dollars a day. My husband goes and gets a job somewhere else. He sends money home. We now have money for not only feeding our kids, educating mm -hmm. them. But you have to do that purposeful programming right. if you're going to include everybody. Right. And they will start to come up with what they want for their own community. Right, right. And Mr. Masiwa, very quickly, you've operated businesses in Africa. Just speak to us on the question of inclusivity. You know, Kenya has been pretty upfront. So let's, let's just talk about Kenya. And let's talk about the digital economy. You all know what it is what impact it had on Kenya being upfront in the development of mobile money and the impact that mobile money has had. Now, in the digital world of what is about to happen, if, mobile, if the digital revolution that's about to hit us was an ocean, mobile money is our toes in the water. I want us to really appreciate, because we might think we're there. Right. Look at the impact we've been able to do with something like mobile money. But you ain't seen nothing 
when you start thinking about artificial intelligence, which is here and now and beginning to happen. So how are we going as entrepreneurs? I'm an entrepreneur. So I begin to think and say to myself, what businesses are we going to create? What industries are we going to create? Are we going to be consumers of oh. the big tech companies that, will, that are now tiddlers in Silicon Valley and in, in Shenzhen? Or are we going to create companies that will rise up out of Nairobi and Harare and Lagos? This is the time we can put the ecosystem in place that enables our own entrepreneurs to play. Right. in this new revolution. Right. Let me just push the thought a little bit. I mean, um, assuming you had your crystal ball and you're looking to the horizon, what are some of the possibilities that you do see as far as this digital conversation is concerned in the developing world? Wow. Let me, let me take a step back to the past right. and not too distant past and then decide whether I have the humility to answer your question. <laughs> Imagine this is 1995. Mm -hmm. And the internet is about to happen. Google doesn't exist. Facebook is a funny kid. OK. Uh, Twitter. Look at what came out of that, Alibaba and so forth. And this is just the last 10, 15 years. Now, if you look at that, the technology, the digital revolution that is beginning to step up now is going to produce global businesses on that scale. Now, some of them, like a Microsoft, will know how to move on to the next game mm -hmm. and become the trillion dollar organization it is. But others are tiddlers right now. They're youngsters working in our garages, right here in the tech hubs. Okay. Young women, young men working away, that if we just give them the spark, we give them the, the, the attention and the resources. We're talking earlier on with Melinda about venture capital. Mm -hmm. You know, I was at a meeting in Johannesburg the other day, and somebody got up and said, Well, Elon Musk came from here. South African banks, would you have funded him? And there were a lot of people looking at their feet, OK? Right. And that's what we've got to answer. It's not that we don't have more Elon Musks. We don't have the ecosystem that could take them forward if they came forward with those kind of ideas. The entrepreneurs are here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want, yes, sure. I want to go ahead. on this point yeah. because um, we, were, we were discussing, as Strive said, in the commission, that you have to open access to capital. Mm -hmm. And if you open access to capital, whether it's the banks and the VC sector, to the traditional players that we already know, you're not going to create the future that you want for your country. Right. You're going to create what you know, what's risk averse, what you've seen. You're not going to find these great entrepreneurs who see what young people want, who see the way they are using their mobile phones. I'll give you a perfect example. I was just uh, in Cape Town two weeks ago. Uh, a young woman there, her parents fought against apartheid, both of them. Her uh, husband is a Bosnian refugee. Mm -hmm. They start at a company called Sweet South. They are not, they're trying to match domestic workers with a burgeoning middle class mm -hmm. who wants to have domestic work done in their homes. But instead of saying we're just matching supply and demand, which might be a traditional way that you would uh, do a capitalistic business, they said, we're going to start with a social bent. Our goal is not just to match supply and demand, but it's to make sure that the domestic workers actually have more leverage in a negotiation with the middle class. Right. So we are going to look at the issues that they have in the pricing and match supply and demand, but we're also going to look at issues like safety. Mm -hmm. When women leave their homes at 5 in the morning, they're more likely to be attacked. Right. And so they said, how do we group those women up and bring them along in transport and have the person whose, say, apartment they're going to understand where they are in that journey? How do we make sure that women, we follow up if right. in fact there's a violent attack? How do we make sure that we build into our economic model insurance so if something is missing in the apartment, the woman, the domestic worker, is, uh, has recourse? 
So when you start with that bent, you start to say, wow, how do we want our society to look? Right. How do we want to make sure we pull people from the informal sector into the formal economy? That's what a great entrepreneur does. But what I'll tell you, having talked to these two founders of Sweet South, they did try to raise money in right. the venture capital market in South Africa. Right. Zero success. Right. Because that venture capital market goes after what they already know. Right. Right. And so they had to convince a development partner not to give them a grant, but a venture capital fund. Right. And so that's what I mean about opening capital, access to capital to people who don't look like the traditional people. Right. Capital but perhaps, Melinda, I mean, if I mean, just putting myself in a banker's or financier's shoes, I mean, there's an age-old argument: you can't fund what you do not understand. Um, and for a lot of these ideas, they are very um, foreign, so to speak, at the inception space. How do we then, and perhaps with lessons from the more developed world, how do we then create an environment where uh, the people, the money in the pocket, can have a conversation with the innovators? The bankers need, the bankers and the VC community mm -hmm. need to include people in their ecosystem who do understand these businesses. That's part of the problem. Right. Even in the US, if you look at Silicon Valley and where the venture capital money is coming from, most of the guys in the business come out of two schools, right. Harvard and Stanford. And so they're funding exactly what they know. Right. So they need to open up their networks and have more women, more people of color. I would say the same thing across Africa. Mm -hmm. There are absolutely people in finance right. that understand different types of markets, but the bankers have to be willing to open up and say, let's have some of those So inclusion people. at that level. Absolutely, right. in the partnership, on the board. Right. So you have to include that in your leadership, mm -hmm. in your management. Not just one person, but several people. Right. Strive, I mean, still on that, um, um, they, they still see that that, that we know. know. I mean, I mean there's a lot of innovation, a lot of fantastic things, for example, in Nairobi, this is right down to Congo, and, uh, and the, the, the hub is amazing. amazing. But, but then, then, how, it seems like we're speaking different languages between innovators and the financiers. Well, the, first of all, we have to have a VC industry. We don't really have one. Right. Uh, and here in Kenya, you're at least trying. There's still a lot of places where the word is still not even known, that we've got to have venture capital. It's, it's not the place for the traditional banks. Mm -hmm. It never was in the US. They come in later in the game. But we need venture <coughs> capital. And that venture capital needs to be internal. Right. I think the, the, one of the challenges we have is a lot of the venture capital we are seeing is coming from outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's really no reason why some of our capital pools, the pension funds and others, cannot begin to find their way into venture capital. Right. But that requires the, the, the government itself to come in and create an, 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 an incentive system for mm -hmm. them to participate. Right. And these are part of the building blocks that must emerge the venture capitalists themselves as much entrepreneurs as the entrepreneurs themselves. Right. Because they're taking the risk as alongside the entrepreneurs right. and helping them uh, uh, bring the ventures to the next level. It's beginning to happen, mm -hmm. but we need to accelerate it. Right. Talking of beginning to happen, and we are at this stage where, where there's this fantastic roadmap that has been placed in front of us. And obviously the idea is to encourage a lot more players to, to buy in and to be part of this. From where you see it, and we can start with Strive, uh, what are some of the low-hanging fruits that you know, developing countries can take advantage of to be part of this uh, digital onslaught? Well, it brings us back to the whole manifesto. Uh, what we've tried to do, even though it's been uh, uh, an extraordinary work over two years, is to capture it as a simple manifesto uh, it's, a, it's a road map uh, that is not too prescriptive, but captures the key things that, that a government needs to be thinking about, right. policy makers need to be thinking about, civil society entrepreneurs. And, we've got to, and as we say, we've got to pull all these towards a common consensus, a compact, as this is what is happening, this is what the opportunities are, these are the threats, and this is how we include others. Mm -hmm. Because it, that inclusion is going to be the major thing. It's going to happen, but how do we ensure that everybody comes on board right. and gets the benefit? Right. 
So this is the time to think about it because we get a chance to shape the future and to look at some of the negative things that we need to, to deal with. We were just saying earlier on, when we were here two years ago, beginning to have this discussion, people were panicking. They were talking about AI taking our jobs, <laughs> robots. We, what happens to us? What, what jobs, jobs do we have? I hope that's not going to be our conversation yeah. today, right? You've promised me that, right? <laughs> We've moved on. Right. We can see the opportunities now. And we're all getting excited. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of threats. Right. And one of the big threats is this inclusion. Right. And Melinda, are, are there quick gains, and how do you leverage them? Well, I think the way for African countries to leverage those gains is to look at other middle-income countries and what they're doing, and look at this toolkit, and look at, like, Kenya just launched its own digital strategy for the continent, mm -hmm. and I, for, for themselves. But I think that others on the continent will start to follow that. Right. One of the things we see, our foundation has been working for quite some time in health on the continent for over 20 years. When you get the pieces right, when you get basic health right, people can go on to educate their kids. When they can educate their kids, they participate in the formal economy. You get that magic cycle working. So what we're talking about here is how do you get the economic pieces right? And one of the things I've been most encouraged about, about this commission's work, is that when they've taken this on the road, the people who are most interested are not just the ICT part of the government, but the finance ministers. Mm -hmm. Because they know that if they invest in the right digital payment system, they get their regulations right, the right digital ID system, the right health record system, they can start to change their economy, bring more people into it, ultimately take a lot of rap right. out of the system, right. and ultimately, long term, you'll build a burgeoning middle class and you'll gain more tax revenue. Right. So I'm encouraged when I think back in health about how the different African countries have learned from other middle-income countries and then learned from one another. Right. I see the same process beginning here in this digital ecosystem. And to me, that's really exciting. Right. And just to bring this to a landing, um, back to the question, how would developing countries get ahead? If you could drop that in uh, one sentence. So I see you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to touch on just one of the core issues, education. Education. We're not going to be in this if we don't get our education system right. Right. And if we don't skill up. Okay? We need to get everybody back to maths and science. We, we, we're running away from maths and science. Well, we're not going to be in the game if, we're, if our kids are not doing maths and science. Okay? We've got to get into the education. We've also got to realize that now education is a lifelong issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, every single one of us has to accept that we, we don't. It doesn't end in this Prussian model where you go to school for so many years, you come out like a soldier, you say, "Okay, give me a job." Okay, it's going to be a continuous process in which we all will be doing new jobs, like my daughter said to me at 11, I said, so what are you going to do? She said, my teacher told me my job hasn't been invented yet. Right. <laughs> okay, that's the future, guys. Right. But we, we start with education. All right. Melinda, what would be your one sentence? Ask the question again. Uh, how do we get ahead as developing countries? You include everybody, and you decide that your people know the great ideas for developing your own economy, and you make sure that women and people who are traditionally marginalized have a seat at the table so you don't bake bias into the system and so they create the economy of the future. We couldn't have imagined Gojek a decade ago and yet they are bringing in Indonesia and Southeast Asia, they are bringing millions and millions of people from informal sector into the formal. They're giving them business training, they're helping women. Women will tell you, I used to be a fruit seller. Now I run a business, and I had violence in my home. I left my husband. Right. I have empower. I'm empowered. Mm -hmm. So you bring everybody into this digital economy, and your people will create the future that you want. But you just got to get the ecosystem right. Fantastic. We we'll leave it there. Many thanks, uh, Melinda Gates. Strive to see you, everybody. A round of applause, please. Thank you very much. I know there's lots of questions. But we have lots of time later in the day to have that. Uh, so this brings this uh, first session to an end. I will allow my guests to uh, kindly take their leave. Thank you very much. You. Um, and as they take their leave, this is just among 
a series of conversations that we intend to have today. Um, because, like we said, over the past two years we've had um, this report come out, and the question is, so what next? How do we move from here? And I'm hoping that that is what we'll be doing in the course uh, of the next few set of conversations. Uh, but even as we think about that, I'd like to prepare your appetite for the next um, um, bit of conversation. So we had the co-chairs of this commission. How about we bring up some of the commissioners who actually did this work? Sounds like a good plan? Yeah. All right. You guys don't sound convincing. Is that a good plan? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. It is now my pleasure to invite uh, on stage uh, Kamal Bhattacharya, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Mojo Chat. It is good if you clap so that you encourage them to come on stage. As Kamal takes his seat, please have a seat. I um, also like to uh, introduce on stage Shivani Saroya, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Tala. Thank you, Shivani. Also on stage, forgive us, we'll be doing a lot of rearrangement. Just think of it as a break. Um, we'll also have Professor Daniela Rus, who's the Director of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Labra Laboratory at uh, MIT. 